Okay, this is Astronomy 320, and we're on Chapter 6. This is about telescopes. We'll try to go through this kind of quickly. There's a lot of stuff we're not going to cover in depth here. But basically, a telescope is a device that allows us to gather light. When we say light, we mean the entire electromagnetic spectrum from radio all the way up to gamma rays. Although X-rays and gamma rays have such short wavelengths, it's difficult to basically get any sort of uh, resolution. Their wavelengths are so short, like we looked on the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, they're, they're like the, uh, the sizes of atoms and, and, and nucleuses. So how the heck are you going to be able to create a surface that's, that's going to be able to reflect those the way we can reflect visible light or other wavelengths that are much, much longer. So radio through ultraviolet, we do pretty good. Then we get into a little bit of a complication with x-rays and especially with gamma rays. Okay, um, here we have three examples of where they used, this is visible light. You can see it better in the book. Here's where I took it out of the book, chapter 6.1 telescopes, and maybe it's a little bit better. This, so this was the um, visible. This was x-ray, those are false colors. You, you don't really see a blue there, but they're indicating how much energy is coming from and what wavelength is coming from those areas, okay? And then this is would be infrared over here. So infrared, x-ray, gamma ray, or I mean, visible, I mean. Gamma ray, x-ray, visible. Okay, now, you have a primary optical element in, in telescopes, a lot of smaller telescopes, or the one that Galileo used, used a lens as its uh, primary optical element. In other words, it used a lens to focus the light down. And in other types of telescopes, you use a mirror to focus the light down. And it turns out the more light you can gather, the greater your resolving power is going to be. So in other words, the dimmer the objects you can see are. So with a small telescope, with a small lens or a small mirror, okay, you're not going to be able to see very, very faint objects. You can increase the um, a number of things you can see compared to the naked eye, for example, because you can imagine that has not much light gathering power at all because it's just your, your retina, basically. But um, the greater you make the light gathering power, the, the more energy you can gather when pointing at some object the more energy you can gather, the fainter the object can be and you can still see it, or you can detect it with radio waves and other types of radiation. Okay, larger lens or mirror, the more light that can be collected and the dimmer the objects that we can observe. So you can imagine this is supposed to be like a big bucket. This is like a little teacup. You can see the big bucket has gathered a lot more water than the little teacup has. Okay, they've been in the rain the same amount of time. Rain's falling and this guy's gathered this much rain, rain water. This guy's only gathered that much rainwater. Same thing with light. The greater the, the area, the aperture they call it, the greater the aperture, the more light can be gathered and the dimmer the objects that can be seen. Okay. Now it turns out because area is goes as d squared, the diameter squared, so just a, a doubling the um, area would, would cause the amount of light gathering power to increase by four times. Now if you make it four times bigger from one meter diameter mirror or lens to four meters four meters can gather 16 times the light of one meter okay just you know if you take one over the other to take it as a ratio you got d squared over d four meters squared over d one meter squared because the pi and the four would cancel out on both of them so you're basically saying four squared divided by one squared or 16 divided by one okay um so this is called light gathering power, the power to gather light. And the more light you can gather, the dimmer the object can be, and you can still detect it. So what lenses do, th 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 as, as the primary optical element, the light comes in, you get this big surface here, the light comes in and you focus it down to a point. Okay, so that'd be the focal length of this particular lens. Refracting telescopes depend on a lens to bend light and focus it to a point. Binoculars, magnifying glasses, oops, binoculars, magnifying glasses, other similar small devices also make use of lenses as their primary optical element. So why does light bend? That's the thing. Light is bending 
as it goes from say air to glass okay it bends because it, it's hitting the surface it's not in the surface perpendicularly this is a curved surface it may not be that clear from the picture but it is a, a curved surface so what, what we do is we, we have a light bulb and you can imagine bubbles of light emulate, emulate, em, emanating from this light bulb okay bubbles of energy bubbles of light energy they're going off in three dimensions I can't really show three dimensional things here but they're going off in three dimensions and those would be called wave fronts now perpendicular to the wave fronts we draw what we call a light ray okay now we get out here the wave fronts get bigger and bigger as we get further and further away and then out here far enough away it's a big huge immense circle but this little localized area we're looking at they look like a couple of parallel lines that's the way they'll be with stars and, and actually just standing in a room five meters from a light source looking through a lens the lights already become where the wave fronts are parallel and therefore the the rays which we draw perpendicular to the wave fronts they'll also be parallel to each other okay so light wave fronts of light like bubbles getting bigger and bigger expand out from the light light rays extend perpendicular to the wave fronts so light rays we draw them perpendicular to the wave fronts now here's a um, marching band as an example okay this is this is like a marching band on the parade grounds the marching band can march very very fast but when it gets to the plowed field it has to slow down so you can imagine the marching band coming in coming in coming in. this would be like a wave front wave front wave front this is like the ray this is showing the direction that the band's actually traveling in the ray okay so when you get here this guy will hit the plowed ground first they'll slow down and this one will hit they'll slow down they'll slow down so as a result, they come here and they slow down kind of at different times, and now they're marching um, basically slower. It's not that obvious, but look at the distance between those two. Imagine these are pictures taken every one second apart. Like from a hot air balloon, we look down on a marching band, and with time elapsed exposure, take a picture every one second. So there's a first second, there's a second second, there's three seconds, there's four seconds, although it looks like they move kind of, there should be probably one in between here. And anyway, you can see that they're not as far apart every second. They haven't moved as far. So they slow down when they get to the plowed field. Okay. The band can much march faster on the parade ground than they can over the plowed field. As a result, if the band meets the boundary at an angle, the direction of their march changes. Okay, so then with light, so you got the light rays coming in. This is these like the wave fronts here. This is the ray coming in. They get onto here. Now look, that part is going slower. The part that's got into the glass or water or whatever is now moving slower than the part that's still out in the air. And then pretty soon more of that part gets more of the wavefront gets into the water and slows down. And now we're going now we're going this direction. Oops. Now we're going this direction. Okay, we bent the light. Okay, it's got to come in at an angle. If it comes in straight, it doesn't bend, it just slows down. But if we get it coming in at an angle, then we can bend the light. We can change the direction the light's traveling in. That's what the lens is supposed to do. Light moves faster in air than it does in glass and everything else except the vacuum. As light reaches the boundary between the glass, such as a lens, it slows down. If it impacts the boundary at an angle, it also bends. Light must pa pass through glass on both surfaces and glass inside must be perfect. In other words, refractor has problems. Um, you gotta have the glass perfect all the way around. With a mirror, you just have to have one surface perfect. And you also, the light has to pass through there, you get little bubbles, little imperfections in there. That's going to cause distortion in your image. Now, chromatic aberration. Different wavelengths bend different amounts. Okay, blue, violet light, the shorter wavelengths will bend more than red light, the longer wavelength. Because of interaction with the lattice as they pass through the glass. So, this causes you to get blurry images. You can focus on the blue then your red will be out of focus. Focus on the red, then your blue will be out of focus. Focus in the middle on the green, and then the green will be in focus, but then the, the blue and the red will be a little bit blurry. Okay, only support for lenses at the edges. Okay, just like your eyeglass, just like eyeglasses. You only support it at the edges. You can't support it anywhere else. Therefore, if the lens is too large and it only has those supports at the edges, it can deform due to gravity. Its own weight can cause it to deform and the image will be distorted. Okay, the mirror is used as a primary optical element in many telescopes. The big, huge telescopes, most of them use the mirror. The biggest reflector telescope I know of is in the Lick Observatory. Your book talks about it a little bit. 
And I've actually been there on a field trip once upon a time, which was kind of interesting. But that's a big uh, refracting telescope. I think it's like the biggest in the world. But the point is, you, you probably want to make these these big, huge telescopes out of mirrors. Most people want to want to have a telescope with a mirror in it instead. Same thing happens. The light comes in, hits the mirror. Okay, the mirror, due to its curvature, will focus it down to a point. You got a second mirror here. This is called a secondary mirror. So this is the primary mirror, primary optical element, and then it sends the light to the secondary mirror, and the secondary mirror then changes it to do an eyepiece. Now here's a lens, but the mirror is what focused the, the light down, okay? So you put your eyepiece there, and then you look at the image through the eyepiece. Okay, telescope mirrors are curved and are coated with a shiny metal, usually silver, aluminum, or occasionally gold to make them highly reflective. Parallel rays are reflected back to the same point, the focus of the mirror, okay? Thus, images are produced by a mirror exactly as they are, are by a lens. So again, we're focusing the light down this will be the focal length for the mirror. You, know, you saw focal length for a lens. This distance here from the mirror to where it focuses the light down to a point, that would be the focal length for the mirror. And then you send it out to the eyepiece. So now, besides visible light, the only other type of electromagnetic radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth, Earth in an easily observable amount, is found in a certain range in the radio part of spectrum. This is another electromagnetic, uh, this is the one in the, in the astronomy book I used to use. I found it on the internet. I've been searching electromagnetic uh, spectrum and getting all these different ones. Finally, I just put in the name of the author of the book plus electromagnetic spectrum. This came up. I wish it had come up sooner. I wish I'd known this one. This one I could have gotten. But anyway, this is visible. See, look, there's your visible. Your, your red first uh, up to your violet. So that reaches the surface of the Earth. That's why we can see the stars. But look, X-rays, ultraviolet is mostly blocked. X-rays are mostly blocked. Gamma rays are mostly blocked. A lot of radio waves are mostly blocked. But look at this window right here. In other words, where it's all blue like this, that means our atmosphere is opaque to it. Where it's clear like this, that means our atmosphere is clear to it. So these wavelengths right here can make it down to the surface of the Earth. So radio waves and, and visible waves, or, or, or yeah, visible light waves, those are the ones that we can use telescopes on the Earth to observe them and get a, quite a bit of information from them. Radio waves have much longer wavelengths, so are more forgiving when it comes to imperfections in the surface of the mirror. So here's the big one. Okay, this one, this is the, oh boy, I looked up how to say this too. Arecibo, Arecibo Radio Observatory in Puerto Rico, built into a natural depression on a mountaintop. It was the largest example of this type of telescope from 1963 when it was built until 2016. A larger one was built in China in 2016. It has a diameter of 305 meters, more than the length of three football fields. So in other words, going across here, you're going, you'd be going more than three football fields across there. So the light, radio waves come in from the, the outside our atmosphere, from all sorts of sources. They hit here, and then they bounce off there, and they, they focus onto this guy right here. This guy you can see is all hooked up. They got their buildings, I guess, right here. All the information is sent there. And they can then uh, track, you know, the radio waves coming in. Now, again, you got to kind of wait. You can't just point this because look, it's a big, huge thing. So you just got to be able to see where it happens to be pointed and, and use the information that way. Um, so anyway, that's that's a big example of a huge radio telescope. You can't build optical ones that big. Or, or just it'd be well, you, you could, but it'd be an incredible undertaking to try to make that much of a surface smooth enough to get really good images. Now, because radio waves have a much longer wavelength, the, uh, the surfaces they interact with do not have to be as perfect as they do with other types of radiation. So the radio wave would be like a big beach ball, and then the light wave, for example, might be like a tiny golf ball. And here you got the surface that's got all sorts of imperfections in it. Now the surface of the, of the beach ball is so big compared to these little tiny def deformations that you, you can pretty much count on getting a true bounce. You see the ball coming up like this, what you think you hope this is as smooth as possible, you'll get a nice bounce like that. It's going where you expect it. The golf ball can go anywhere. Okay, we don't know. This can depend. The golf ball surface is so small, it's it's in the neighborhood of these imperfections, so it could bounce off and go that way. So the big huge surface will give you a nice bounce over a rough, rough surface, but something like a golf ball, which is around the size of, of the little imperfections here, that could go anywhere. 
Imagine the beach ball representing the long wavelength radio waves and a golf ball representing the shorter wavelength visible light waves hitting the rough surface. The beach ball gives a more expected bounce, but the golf ball could end up anywhere. Now, telescope interferometry. This is, when it comes to resolution, this right here is as good as having a big telescope radio telescope mirror that's this big okay because you're, you're you're seeing the signal they're all pointed at the same thing you're seeing it come over like this you're seeing it come in like this you're seeing it come in like this so it adds to the resolution how clear the image is going to be now the thing is like the, you said we, the, the big one in, in, in Puerto Rico those are going to gather more energy right because if the radio wave comes in and hits here hits the ground over here well if you had a big big bowl like this that the, that bull captures it. These guys don't. So you're not going to make up for the the lack of. Um, you're not going to be able to capture as much light energy or radio wave energy as you would with a big huge bull. So that's one of the the problems with this. Okay. So but you do get better resolution for a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper to do this than it is to build this. Okay. A lot a lot cheaper. So you get the resolution, but you just do not gather the amount of energy because you had telescopes coming like an, an array like this, light that would hit here would miss, right? But it, with this telescope here, this will gather and send it up there. So you're not going to gather as much light. Okay, so you imagine people, well, anyway, so let's see. An array of, teles, array of radio telescopes can be used to collect the same images as large radio telescope. Two telescopes separated by one kilometer provide the same resolution as would a single dish one kilometer across, okay? They would not be able to collect as much radiation, though, and weaker signals would not be detected. Okay, adding more radio, adding more radio telescopes to the array would increase. Okay, there's the word, word there's telescope, uh, radio telescope should be in there. Okay, and that's it for this. Now the it's, uh, this guy here. So this guy here has been uploaded, even though it's the 12th right now. I'm doing this on Sunday at, at 11:39. Okay, so you got the 13th there, that's tomorrow, that's probably when you guys will be seeing this. Okay, so it's it's already up on, this is going to be you guys here, so there it is. It's, it's actually chapter 6, I made a mistake here. I think we skipped chapter 5, I think, and we went to chapter 6, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a little bit messed up, but we're doing chapter 6 right now, okay, so the telescope one. This one right here, 6.1. Okay. Now, as for the. Okay, so how much more light would a 3 meter telescope gather compared to a 1 meter telescope? Remember, it's the d squared. So you'd have 3 squared over 1 squared. 3 squared is 9, 1 squared is 1. So a 3 meter telescope could gather 9 times more light than a one meter telescope. It would have nine times the light gathering power just by increasing it by three meters from one meter. A refracting telescope makes use of a lens. A lens to, um, to hold on a second. Okay, um, well I did, I, 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 I added this number six that I forgot about earlier. I've already uploaded it. So, refracting telescope, that makes use of a lens to focus the light. Why does light bend when it travels from one medium to another, such as air, to another medium, such as water or glass? Well, because it travels at different velocities in different mediums. So it's going to slow down as it goes from air into the glass. Or, yeah. Now, in terms of light, what is a wave front? The wave front is like the bubble of energy coming out of the source. So it's the, uh, like the marching band, the, the the front of the marching band, that'd be like the wave front. The light ray, that is really direction, first of all, it's drawn perpendicular to the wave front, and it's showing the direction that the light is traveling in. Okay, some limitations faced by refracting telescopes. Okay, this is the one that I just added just now, because I, I meant to add it earlier, but I saw that I didn't have it. So some limitations faced by refracting telescopes. First of all, two surfaces have to be as perfect as possible. With a mirror, only one side has to be perfect. Also, the light has to travel through the lens. That means that you gotta 
any, any little deformity inside the, the lattice of the lens, like a little bubble that gets in there, that's going to mess with your image. And then the other thing was chromatic aberration. That's where different wavelengths will focus at different points. So you get a blurry image, a little bit blurry image. Maybe your eyes can't notice it that much, or maybe really good eyes could notice it. But it's not going to be really finely focused like you can with a mirror. Because that, that, the, the, in that case, the wavelengths all move together. Also, you can only support the lens on the edges because the light has to move through. With a mirror, you could put any, you could put a steel backing back there. It doesn't matter. <coughs> so, so basically, you only have to go through one surface. So, but if you bake too big of a lens and it's only being supported by the edges, then if it's too much weight, it can start to sag and deform and give you bad images. Reflecting telescopes use mirrors as their primary optical element. Okay, visible and radio telescopes, those are the ones that are found mostly on the surface of the Earth. That is because going back to, let's see, we want this guy here. Going back to up here. Where was it? I missed it. There we go. Because those, not all radio waves, but just certain radio waves, they penetrate all the way down to the ground of the Earth. Same with the visible section of the of the uh, of the thing. So that's what's going on there. Okay, and then why can the surface of a radio telescope be rougher than the surface of a visible telescope? Because the wavelengths are so large for a radio waves that they're more forgiving, and you can have people walking around. They have to have special shoes on. But the other textbook I have shows guys with these special shoes on walking around on, on the surface of the um, of the radio telescope doing maintenance. So you'd never probably consider even doing that with a, with a mirror, with a, with a visible telescope mirror. Okay, so I think that's everything. And so let me say goodbye for now, and I'll talk to you later.